Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in about two minutes, just letting more people trickle in. Hi right, folks, we're gonna give people about one more minute and then get started. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar names on the on the list here. We had over 100 people register for tonight's event, which speaks to how interested people are in this topic. This is the first lecture in the Conservation Department's 2023 Environmental Lecture Series. The second lecture is coming up this Saturday, March 25th at 11 a.m., and it will be a turtle lecture and nature walk featuring scientists from Fordham University on their research uh, right here in Binney and Bruce Parks. That event will be an in-person event held at Greenwich Audubon. We also encourage everyone to sign up for the Greenwich Sustainability Newsletter. We're gonna drop that link into the chat in just a second. Uh, if you want to receive more information on all the sustainability events happening in and around Greenwich. I wanna thank the panelists that are here tonight. We also wanna thank the Cobb Library for co-hosting this event, the Town of Greenwich Parks and Recreation Department and the Greenwich Land Trust for being partners. A few housekeeping items before we get started. The program will be about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the town website. Also look out for a follow-up email that will include the recording, uh, resources and information on how you can support natives in your, in your yard. We hope you all had a chance to watch the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation or DEC's sponsored documentary, Uninvited, The Spread of Invasive Species. It's available to watch for free on YouTube and we'll also include that link in, in the chat if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet. The documentary talks about the significant threat invasive species are to the state's biodiversity and ecosystems, public health, the agricultural industry, and the economy. The documentary, as well as these public webinars and talks about invasive species are important tools to help educate the public about invasives and what technologies and resources are available to help stop the spread. The documentary also addresses prominent emergent invasive species, such as the spotted lanternfly, which you'll hear about tonight too, while highlighting the efforts to combat this and other pests. We highly recommend that you check it out. Tonight's panelists on invasive species are leading professionals in their fields. We are very fortunate to have Will Keyes, Executive Director of the British Land Trust, Beth Evans, Director of Environmental Affairs for the Town of Greenwich, and Dr. Greg Kramer, Superintendent of Parks and Trees and Tree Warden for the Department of Parks and Recreation. We are grateful to each and all of you for being here and thank you again for being our panelists tonight. So let's dive into tonight's topic. We are here to talk about invasive species. And when we're talking about invasives, we're talking about plants, animals, or pathogens that are non-native to the ecosystem they are under consideration or whose introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or human health. And invasive spread in a myriad of different ways 
Uh, a lot of them are hitchhikers on cargo ships and maybe the ballast water or on wooden pallets that the cargo comes in from. Sometimes there are intentional introductions. Um, and sometimes there, we've seen that the release of maybe a pet, a reptile, a fish, an amphibian in a habitat can lead to invasive species. Some of the invasives such as running bamboo, Japanese barberry, and burning fish are still sold in nurseries today. Um, so please avoid planting them in your yard as they can aggressively take over the landscape. In Greenwich, we're lucky to have a lot of amazing ecosystems. We have islands and coastal habitats such as rocky, muddy, or sandy areas. We have expansive inland wetland networks with many lakes, ponds, and freshwater tributaries. We have lots of different habitats for different species to be able to find their niche and become established. So there's a lot, of, lot to protect and there's a lot that makes us vulnerable. In response to having all these unique habitats and unique approaches to invasive species, I would love to hear from our, our panelists. And Will, I'll start with you and then go to Beth and Greg, but Will, can you talk to us about some of the species of concern in your opinion? Um. Thanks, Sarah. So we kind of divvied up a number of species here, and uh, we're getting a little bit of a laugh earlier about who had the worst. So we'll uh, we'll start with some well-known ones um, that we often deal with and see uh, throughout our community. Um, I'm going to touch on Japanese knotweed, porcelain berry, and emerald ash borer. Um, to start with, um, Japanese knotweed is a large um, herbaceous perennial found all over town. Um, it, it's very um, evenly distributed and very adaptable to anything from shade to riparian areas, brackish water. Uh, it really likes sun, but will do well in, as I said, shady areas as well. Uh, it can grow up to three to nine feet tall. Um, I find it often um, on sandbars or, or riparian areas in river corridors and stream corridors. Uh, where it kind of floats down, the rhizomes uh, float downstream and spread that way. Uh, we often find it. We often find it in fill that comes into a, a job site or or such. Uh, it's originally from, as its name says, uh, Japanese knotweed. It's from Northeast Asia, Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan. It was introduced um, in the late 1900s, uh, 19th century, I should say, um, as an ornamental plant and has kind of spread from there. It, it it forms a, a pretty dense monoculture, and I think that's one of the challenges uh, from uh, an ecosystem services component is that it forms a big monoculture with very little diversity. Um, it doesn't really provide much um, food or shelter uh, for for animals um, or or other um, organisms. It's it's a really just a a really dense shrub um, and it can form up to a couple acres large. So once it gets going, it's, it spreads pretty rapidly. Uh, and it's just a, it's a, it's a challenge once it gets a hold of to, uh, to, to manage it in any sort of small capacity. Uh, jumping to probably what I think, and I've seen lately as we drive along our roads here in Greenwich um, is porcelain berry, which is an, uh, a perennial vine. Uh, it's a woody deciduous plant. Uh, it has uh, some beautiful, it gets its name from the berries uh, that look like little porcelain dishes. Birds love them. It's spread through um, mostly the droppings of birds who eat them and then spread them out. Um, Again, this is often found on, on woodland edges. Uh, roadside habitats are kind of the key component um, and kind of the area we see it the most. We don't really see it in the middle of a forest because it doesn't like shade as much. It really likes those side areas. Um, again, it was brought over as an ornamental 100 and 200 years ago um, and has spread rapidly. Um, unlike a bittersweet vine that kind of chokes um, the host plant this just climbs up the uh, up it and smothers it that way so it doesn't allow sunlight to reach the host plants that it's climbing up um, and i've just seen it pop up uh, significantly and you know there's some some areas throughout town where you can really see it just kind of forming this 
wall of green it can grow up to 50 feet tall. Uh, the roots, uh, when we've tried to pull them, can be 20 feet and as thick as, you know, almost as thick as a wrist. So it, the, the root system is really vigorous. Um, and lastly, um, unfortunately, a very, very important tree in our ecosystem, but also um, used for baseball bats to firewood to baskets um, in the Northeast is uh, uh, the emerald ash borer, which is affecting all species of ash here in town. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty well established and we're seeing rapid decline of our ash trees. And I'm sure Greg can speak to the tree guys that are out there taking down dead ash. Um, you know, the ash trees get really brittle once they get the emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is an insect. It's from Asia, um, less than 10 years ago, it was found in Michigan and has spread rapidly through the Great Lakes into the Northeast and is found um, pretty extensively throughout the Northeast. It's now been found in Oregon, so it's it's spreading rapidly. Um, most of these insects fly from tree to tree and can kind of spread about 15 miles each year and compound that. Um, some signs you might see that a tree is sick um, are some D-shaped holes, and it really does look like the, an upside down D. Um, and they're about an eighth of an inch in diameter. Those are the exit holes of um, the larva stage that then and the nymph stage that come out of the tree. And it's really these larva underneath the bark after the adult lays the eggs, they burrow in, they make these galleries um, and that really choke off the vascular system of the tree. You also often see dieback, uh, bark splitting and heavy woodpecker activity because of the insects. So um, those are my... Uh, that's my hit list for now. Thanks, Will. I know, uh, you know, the emerald ash borer is very specific in the, the species that it's going after, but porcelain berry, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that just chooses anything to climb up and nothing is safe. Um, Japanese knotweed, it's, it'll grow anywhere, as you said. Right. Unfortunately, we do have ash trees all over town. So the, the emerald ash borer is now, it's not just exclusively in one neighborhood, it, it, it does fly all over, so. Beth, uh, can you talk about uh, running bamboo? I know we've seen that driving around town. We've seen these forests of them um, and also Mile a Minute, another favorite. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with Mile a Minute because it's the easy one. Um, I, they left it for me, which was nice. Mile a Minute is a, an annual vine. It's not uh, perennial. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, live year to year, but it does spread like nobody's business. As Will said, with the porcelain berry uh, vines covering other plants and smothering them, mile a minute, believe it or not, can do that to a, an area in one growing season. So it's in the tear thumb family. And if you wonder if you've ever encountered mile a minute vine, it has a heart-shaped leaf. And uh, when it has flowered, which are very inconspicuous, it produces a nice little blue fruit, which is very pretty at the very end of the vine. Um, that blue fruit is a favorite of birds, and that's uh, like porcelain berry, one of the ways that myelin and it spreads from site to site. Um, and more locally, it spreads uh, from insects, uh, taking the berries and, and moving them around. But mile a minute is, is a, it's completely indiscriminate. Uh, it does like sunny areas, so you're likely to find it at the edge of woodlands, but um, I've also found it deep within a, a mature forest in small patches. So um, there's there's really no telling where it's going to spring up, but if you go to pull it up, which is the recommended management uh, strategy for it, you, you ought to have good heavy gloves on and long sleeves because the barbs on the back of the leaves and on the vines are sharp and numerous. Um, so that is uh, one of the one of the vines that you'll see around. Um, as I say, it's an annual, so it can be controlled by pulling if you find it before it has set seed. Um, the other uh, invasive that that we see a lot around town um, is running bamboo, and running bamboo is not. Uh, produced, not spread around by animals, it's spread around by landscapers and people who want to use it for a screen. 
It grows very tall, it grows very dense, and it grows very fast uh, using rhizomes, underground root systems with buds that uh, uh, can travel long distances and, and form thickets uh, incredibly quickly. And what people don't realize, they may screen whatever they don't want to look at on their property, but chances are running bamboo will uh, enter other people's property and become a real management issue. Running bamboo has been introduced in some areas, in riparian areas, stream areas, river corridors, and uh, it can sometimes just completely block off the, the edge of those systems and make it very difficult for wildlife and certainly humans to get back and forth. Uh, it is very, very difficult to control. So uh, my recommendation is, as uh, Will said, it's still sold, you can still get it, uh, but please try not to, try not to plant it uh, if you can avoid it. Uh, and the final insect, uh, as opposed to the emerald ash borer, which is moving with incredible speed and doing incredible damage to uh, one of the species in our forest. Uh, the Asian longhorn beetle is also a uh, insect that is considered invasive and it will uh, infest hardwoods, uh, all sorts of hardwoods, maple, birch, elm, and uh, if they were already left, it would also in infest ash trees. And the Asian longhorn beetle are, are uh, striking black and white insects with very, very long antennae. And um, someone brought me one and they were all excited because they found this pretty bug. And I was, I was not happy about that at all. Um, it kills trees very slowly. It, it has, uh, like the ash borer, it will bore a hole and lay an egg under the bark of a tree that egg then hatches and the larvae feed on the, the sapwood of the tree. And uh, it can go through a number of stages each year and it can overwinter in any one of those stages. So unlike some insects that die off as soon as we get a hard frost, the uh, Asian longhorn beetle does not die off. And uh, it could be two or three years before you notice the tree is starting to uh, change color earlier in the, in the fall, summer, late early summer. Um, and it, it can take 10 years before that tree is uh, impacted enough to actually die. So if you see a black and white beetle uh, with long antennae, please, please report it. Uh, you can report it to our department, uh, the town hall. You can report it to, to Dr. Kramer. Uh, report it to someone though, please. Thanks, Beth. And I, um, I, I, I'm not sure when it was, but fairly recently, Connecticut passed a law about bamboo, and that if you have it on your property, you you have to manage it. it. Right. Yeah, you have to control it. So if it, it goes onto your neighbor's property, your neighbor is allowed to say, um, remove it. Right, and that's a hard task. It's nearly impossible. So. Dr. Kramer, I'm going to pass this to you. Um, if you're able to talk about it, um, we'd love you to talk about, um, you know, bittersweet is very, very common, as Will said, uh, when he was talking about porcelain berry, we have bittersweet, um, phragmites is a big one, um, and then we'll get to um, Atlantis and spotted lanternfly. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, so as Sarah said, I'm, I'm going to talk about Phragmites, uh, Asian bittersweet, Atlantis, and spotted lanternfly. I'd like to start off with with Phragmites um, australis. This is a uh, a wetland species, both in brackish waters and freshwater systems, that becomes a monoculture, and a monoculture in itself um, has negative effects on diversity. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it limits. The amount of animals and and uh, and water flow that can can go through the ecosystem, but I, I did want to talk a little about the history of of Phragmites. Um, there is there is a native species of Phragmites. Sorry, I'm going to just turn this off for a minute so we don't get uh, crazy here. There is a, a native species of Phragmites that is quite uh, well behaved, doesn't produce these 
dense monocultures and um, it allows wildlife to live uh, in harmony amongst, amongst itself. But what is interesting about Phragmites and why it became so problematic is we've, we've changed the ecosystems and it, it's to the benefit of these, these uh, species that take advantage of these new ecosystems that our native plants may not have performed very well in. So we've, we've increased our nutrient loads, we've disturbed soil, you know, shorelines, we've, we've increased salinity. So that all played, plays a factor in, in why this introduced Phragmites is doing so well. But also there's been genetic research and they found that there's been several, if not more, various introductions over time of this non-native species that was able to cross genotypes and, and kind of make a quote unquote super Phragmites. So it's, it's interesting. So there's these various introductions in different different locations and they've, they've kind of met, although the same species, they were able to crossbreed and produce a better, better adapted species. Um, so so that's, that's one of the things going on with Phragmites. Um, its management is very difficult and we could, we could have a very long two hour discussion about how to manage Phragmites. Um, there's different methods used from burns to mechanical cutting to herbicide um, to flooding. Um, they all work at different times of the year to a certain extent. Um, there's there's uh, you know preferable times to do any one of those, but uh, Phragmites is, is a problem and, it's, and it seems to be becoming worse. Interesting in, in some of the areas where it's native to, they're actually losing Phragmites. So maybe we can, we can ship some back to where they, they came from. <laughs> But that's, uh, that's Phragmites. Uh, Asian bittersweet, I did want to talk a little bit about that. And interesting enough, there is a native bittersweet and it's becoming quite endangered. So um, it, uh, I'll point out the differences so that if one is out cutting, um, you could maybe you know, look at it and do some comparisons. They basically grow the same. Um, they're both very vigorous. The uh, introduced one happens to be a little more vigorous. And the way you tell the difference is uh, the way the fruit is arranged. The introduced species has, uh, doesn't have terminal buds. It's sort of along the branch that's, that's fruiting you know, with this, these beautiful orange fruit, whereas the native one is clustered at the end. And it was, as most things were, we were saying earlier, vines, it was introduced as an ornamental. Uh, wildlife do relish the fruit and as, Will and, and Beth were saying about other different uh, species that were introduced. It is spread by birds, and uh, it is used a lot in the in the ornamental industry for for flower arrangements. It's not uncommon for for folks to make wreaths in the fall with these beautiful orange and yellow fruit and uh, put it outside on a door, and a bird says, "Ooh, perfect uh, perfect lunch and dinner," and take a couple of Beak folds and fly off. And there we have another population of, of bittersweet coming up in the environment. Um, some of the tactics on, on management are um, if it's a very old vine, it doesn't have very much vitality left in it. So if you if you cut it at the base and it's in amongst a forested ecosystem, it it it's it does start to die out over time. It never it's never able to reach the sun canopy again. So it over time will die out. Um, there are different applications you can put on the cut as well. And um, I found myself, if I'm out and about and I see it in the shade and you pull it, it, it does come up fairly easily before it gets too big. So hand, hand pulling is, is not super difficult, doesn't, doesn't root very deep. It's sort of in the leaf layer. Um, so that's, that's some of the tactics to, to manage um, uh, porcelain, I'm sorry, bittersweet vine. Um, just kind of going on to Ailanthus trees. Uh, Ailanthus tree is, as we know, the tree of heaven. It also is the poster child for a tree grows in Brooklyn. It is a, a, a tree that was brought to this, this country as an ornamental. It grows very vigorously. It, it too is either male or female. The females can produce quite showy samaras in the fall that turn an orange and a red. And uh, it's quite vigorous. And it, it's a pioneering species, successional species. So it, it, it perpetuates um, a successional type of environment where native trees 
can't grow and produce a, a mature forest. It's always kept in this successional uh, ecosystem. And that has a lot to do with the roots that have a allopathic uh, effect in inhibiting other trees from growing around it. Um, one thing I will say about Atlantis tree, and I'm doing a bit of an experiment on this right now, it is very susceptible to verdicidium wilt. And I have seen a lot around town dying. And I've been kind of going and finding the ones that are dying and taking some, some uh, bark samples and doing a wound and putting the bark back in the healthy ones and see, see what happens. And one of the ways indicatively you can tell if a Atlantis tree has verdicidium wilt is wilt is if you, you scrape the bark and it's yellow underneath, that's a good indicator that it's already uh, susceptible to, to the wilt. And you'll see the leaves start to, to dry off and, and sort of die off and, and the tree itself will, will die maybe in a year or two. And uh, because it does grow clonally from the roots, once one tree has verdiostrin wilt, most of them around, because they're all the same tree will, will die. Uh, I did want to talk about a little bit about spotted lanternfly because they kind of go hand in hand now. Uh, Atlantis trees and spotted lanternfly. Uh, spotted lanternfly was introduced fairly recently. Uh, they're having a huge problem in the mid-Atlantic region and now it's in our region here in the Northeast. Um, it's not a fly, it is a leaf hopper. Um, and, it, and it really gets its fecundity, meaning it's high reproductive rate and its toxicity, which is it expresses in its uh, aposematic coloration, meaning that warning coloration that, uh, as you know, with monarchs, it, they, they warn we uh, don't eat us. So what they do is they absorb those chemicals into themselves and become distasteful to predators, particularly birds, not so much other insects. So if we can remove Ilanthus trees, we could teach, or the animals, I should say, can learn a, a behavior that this aposymptotic coloration is not necessarily indicative of a bad tasting, big, juicy insect. So we're around town, what we're doing is we're removing Ilanthus trees, and hopefully that'll, for one, limit the amount of lanternfly would, that we have in town, but we'll also the ones that don't live off Atlantis trees um, won't be a learned behavior for the birds to, to not, pr not predate on them. So that's, that's one way we're managing. And other ways they're being managed is that they're actually injecting Atlantis trees with a systemic in insecticide so that when they do feed, they actually die. Uh, we, we're not doing that around town, but that is a management tactic that is being used in different locations. Um, so that's some of the some of the management for for Atlantis and uh, and spotted lanternfly as well. Thanks, Dr. Kramer. I know um, for those of you who may have watched the the documentary, the um, DEC documentary, they they talk a lot about the impact of spotter and lantern fly on um, crops. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's an up and coming very, uh, up he around here, very worrisome um, invasive that, that Dr. Kramer is, is absolutely, you know, I, the first time I said something to him about it, he was like, oh yeah, and he knew everything, all these things about it. So um, it, it's definitely an issue. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kramer for, for that. You know, each of you in your in your organizations and in the the partners that you work with, you're doing conservation, you're doing stewardship, you're um, you're preserving uh, nature the way it is, while also um, with a, a changing environment due to both natural and anthropogenic forces. So I, I wanted to sort of get a feel from each of you, and, and I'll go in the same order. I'll start with Will, and then go to Beth, and then Dr. Kramer. If you could talk about your work and how you're in your work dealing with rampant invasives that you come across. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so here at Grange Land Trust, uh, we are uh, the largest private land manager in the town of Greenwich. We conserve 869 acres in town. So we have an active stewardship staff 
um, and volunteers. Uh, we currently have four staff that are dedicated to stewardship of our properties. Um, our properties cover, uh, there are 82 different properties in town that we have, and they range in size from less than an acre. Um, and our largest is uh, a conservation easement that's about 90 plus acres. Uh, so we're actively managing our properties. Um, we have a management plan for each one of those properties. We're an accredited land trust. So we have a rigorous um, kind of best practices that we follow to ensure that we can properly manage our 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 properties um you know the, the the issue with invasives is kind of like it's a little bit bit of putting your finger in the hole um on the sinking ship i don't want to sound you know too negative but it's where do you put your resources and i i guess that's the point that i want to get at is that you know we have limited staff we have limited budgets so what we've tried to do is really identify, you know, what properties either have extensive infestations um, or properties that we really want to preserve uh, because of their uniqueness or their biodiversity. Um, so we've kind of taken those two philosophies of, you know, where can we use our resources best? Um, and we are out on our properties uh, every day. And, you know, we, we do find that it's a, it is definitely an uphill battle in some senses, um, but quite rewarding when we do get a handle on it. Um, and then we can then supplement where there were um, invasives with natives. And we have a, a pretty rigorous program of growing seed, from seed native plants to plant in, in the place of the invasives. Um, but it takes consistent management and, and a lot of time um, to kind of achieve that balance. So it's it's um, for us, it's just trying to find the the properties that we want to put our resources into, because as the town or the land trust or a private landowner or, or neighbor or whoever it is, you know, there are limited resources out there. So we kind of have to choose and we're really guided by these management plans that we have for each one of our properties. Well, I was um, recently walking in the, uh, the John street, the, um, the lap Lapham preserve. preserve. Yep. Yes. And um, I could, you know, very, very big property. And I uh, couldn't believe where the Phragmites was just <laughs> away from roads away, from, you know, it, um, it surprised me. But. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, sometimes where you least expect mm -hmm. it. Um, and that just brings up, you know, uh, what Beth was talking about mile a minute, you know, we had a huge infestation of mugwort that we treated. And what turned out um, was that we ended up having a big mile a minute infestation after that, um, that we then had to deal with because of the, the nature of the, um, the growing cycle of that with it, you know, it, it really likes disturb, disturbed soil, um, so when we took out the mugwort, we kind of allowed the the mile a minute to get in there. And that almost took a at least a year, if not two years um, in, in that. So it's um, you never know when it's going to pop up. And unfortunately, uh, it's really hard to control and 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 figure out where where it's going to come next. And I um, I have to give a shout out to um, one of the. Uh, attendees, Myra Clackenbrink was just chatting in the um, the Q and A. Which everybody, please, if you have questions, uh, please put in the, your question the, in the Q and A. But she said uh, she made a comment that you know the thing I'm learning is the less we disturb soil, the fewer chances there are for invasives to take hold. So Absolutely. thank you, Myra, for for that. I think we're in agreement. Beth, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pass this over to you. If you could talk about um, how how your work, how our work uh, deals with invasives. I was gonna say it's our work, but. Um... As, as a department uh, in Town Hall, um, Greenwich is uh, blessed with people who really care about um, helping citizens understand um, what's happening at, at their homes, in their areas, at their parks. And we have uh, a lot of information available. I see one of our, our main uh, tasks really is is education and, and outreach. Um, this webinar is a perfect example um, so that we can provide information for citizens, for groups on uh, what it is they're seeing happen on the landscape, 
what they might be able to do about it and, and some resources that they might be able to use to uh, further that effort. And the other side of that is to encourage people to try to plant uh, native species and, and give those native species a chance to reestablish areas that had been impacted uh, either by development, lawn, uh, or by invasive species, give the native species a chance, which will help the native insects, the native butterflies, the native birds, uh, and the native small mammals to, to really thrive in this uh, very diverse and very rich environment that the town has, as, as Sarah said. And one, one species that uh, has has come to attention. Uh, if you spend much time at the shore, you're certainly familiar with uh, green crabs. Uh, my kids used to love to catch them and and have crab races and things with them. But uh, green crabs are actually invasive. Uh, they were introduced years ago, and they've now become one of the most common species uh, in the Northeast along the shoreline. But there's a, another crab that has been uh, found. Uh, it's actually partly saltwater and partly freshwater. It's mostly freshwater. It's called the Chinese mitten crab. And um, it's one that's just beginning to be seen around. And uh, if, you're, if you happen to see a crab, particularly in a stream or a place you wouldn't expect to see a crab, and it looks like it has big fuzzy mittens on its, on its claws, it has little white tips to those claws, please call either our, our department or DEP and report where you saw it and, and when, because that's a species that's just starting to get started. So uh, come to us with questions. We'll try to find answers. We'll try to help you uh, find the right management and the right approach. Thanks, Beth. Greg, uh, I'd love to love for you to tell us all about um, how Parks and Recreation and the, the Tree Division is, um, you know, all the work that you do in all of the parks at, uh, in town, but also, you know, how are you handling invasives when you when you come up to them? All right, thank you, Sarah. I would, I just wanted to say about spotted lanternfly, if, if it were host specific, it would be a wonderful biological control for a land industry. <laughs> But unfortunately, it's not. It has a servicing a quite quite a huge host range. Uh, I believe it's up some somewhere up into the thirty some odd species it can it can live on. But um, oh, my camera's acting up again. Sorry, let me try it. But um, how we manage a lot of the different parks is there's a lot of diversity in a lot of the the parks that uh, you know we all work in as a collective. We town of Greenwich. And um, we just uh, finished up a project working with cl very closely with conservation, removing Phragmites from a pond in Bruce Park, which is a uh, it's a tidal tidal pond. It does have some saltwater um, brackish components to it, and uh, we had got an excavator went in and, and removed it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the spring to see to see uh, how well. I'm sure there are a couple of pieces here and there that were missed but easy enough to remove at this point. So that was a great project because eventually that whole pond would be, would be Phragmites, um, no question about that. And that would certainly limit the diversity and also just to, to, to you know, the, the visitor experience, people go there to see the water and, and the wildlife and the birds and, and the ducks, they don't go there to see the monoculture of, of Phragmites. <laughs> so that was a, that was a good project as a, as a collective town project. Uh, you know, we remove Atlantis trees when we can. You know, as Beth was saying, whenever we remove something, we want to put something back, or at least, if not one thing, more things. Um, so we're, we're doing a project now in Greenwich Point. We just finished up where we removed a bunch of Atlantis trees. Uh, we grounded out the stumps. Hopefully that'll keep them from coming back. And, and we put in a bunch of different native trees, um, some oaks, we put in some persimmons, uh, we also put in some red buds. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to the, the future to diversify and hopefully mitigate any future outbreaks. You know, having a, a healthy ecosystem with, with diverse native plants helps mitigate any type of disease or, or pest that might come through and, and wipe out, you know, one entire population of, of one type of plant. So that's one of our strategies as well. 
And then in, in some of the parks, we're, uh, we're removing a lot of invasives with the help of different friends groups that are wonderful that, that go out and help us on all these projects and, and spearhead the projects with volunteer groups. So it's, it's, it's varied. Um, each, each park is almost unique to itself and how we manage them um, certainly is, uh, is different and in each way, each way we do that, yeah. Greg, you had uh, just mentioned, you know, the different strategies and, and you've all, Will and Beth have also touched on this. And um, I've certainly heard, and I'm sure all of you have too, uh, you know, a strategy is maybe just letting nature, quote unquote, take its course. Um, it's, this is not always a, a feasible approach, right? Um, and so I would like to get your thoughts and opinions on um, how you know investing resources into invasive removals um it, it can spend a lot of time money resources but but why do we do this why are we trying to to get rid of the you know these invasive species and and bring back more more mm -hmm. natives so i'm gonna i'm gonna go around again i'll start with will you know i think it's definitely an uphill battle um but i think it is you know our our duty in some sense to try to conserve and and protect especially really diverse and important habitats i wouldn't say that everyone is equal um so i think understanding what you have um and then conserving what you have to increase and promote the biodiversity on that you know as, as I, I'm sure everybody knows, I mean, everything is so related and intertwined that if all of a sudden you have a, you know, you just let it a monoculture of Phragmites go, um, it's not just, you know, the birds, but it'll be the insects and the, you know, it, it, it kind of spirals. Um, so I think from our standpoint, inventorying what you have and then conserving and promoting that biodiversity is is vitally important um, and then putting your resources towards those properties that are that are your gems that are your diverse ones that are um, unique in some way um, you know we can't go out with 869 acres it would be nearly impossible for us to get every invasive off of that um, you know also to what degree and, and which invasive is it you know there's some that are you know super aggressive and will just take over a property um so making sure those don't get hold you know so i think that's another component to this is if you just let them loose um we all know what's going to happen and i i think at least as the stewards of of conservation properties it's our duty and our job to ensure that we're taking care of those properties um, that have been entrusted with uh to us so you know that's why i find it in, vitally important that we kind of take approach an approach that's more aggressive and forward facing than just kind of sitting back and letting nature take its course. Well, Beth, I know from wetlands and conservation, we we do get a lot of plans, wetland applications that look to um, to help a wetland to, to, to maybe remove some invasives. And it can be a really lengthy process. You know, some of these invasive removal plans are three to five years um what, what's your outlook on you know on on this do you let nature take its course do you invest in the resources well i i have a, an opinion on that sarah and i i've shared it with some of the staff in the, in the department um i i see uh invasive uh management really it, management being the key word um, we weed our gardens because we don't want weeds to overtake our whatever we're trying to grow, our tomatoes, our lettuce. Um, and a weed to a botanist is any plant that's growing where you don't want it to grow. So invasive species are uh, often plants that are growing where we don't want them to grow, where they're out competing some of the other plants. And as, as property owners, as uh, people reviewing permits uh, for those property owners, I think it's our job to help them come up with a realistic view of what managing invasive species really uh, entails. And it's, as you say, it's not a one and done. It's not pull it out and it'll never come back. It's often a long-term watching for it, 
taking it, taking care of it when you see it, and putting something else in its place that uh, is better suited and, and provides better habitat or even better visuals for your property. So. And, and Dr. Kramer, you know, with, again, with all of the parks and schools that are managed under the parks department, um, you sometimes have to uh, pick and choose uh, where your resources, where your, your crew is going to go. And, and um, but how, you know, what goes through your, your mind when you're, when you're looking at invasives at big picture across Greenwich parks? Well, if I could answer this in, in two ways, Sarah, there's a philosophical way that I, I sort of view it is, you know, when you walk through the woods and it feels right, and you know, when you walk through somewhere and it just, it's kind of innate in all of us, there's a feeling, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of, this is, sorry, my camera is going again. <laughs> this feels right. There's, there's a, Hamad, there's, a local feel to it. Um, and I've, I've actually laughed to myself because as I'm hiking through, it's like, I, I could be hiking in China right now. I mean, what makes me, what, why am, am I really in North America and on the East Coast? Um, so, so there's that philosophical uh, pres preservation of identity and locale. Um, but then on, on the other side of it, there is the practical side and, and you know, what, what, what can be done and how we how we manage our, our funds and, and what we what we have to do. And, and I think the approach has been, at least at this point, and I think we'll certainly touched upon this, is is preserving, you know, taking an inventory and, and sometimes having to choose and say, okay, this this area is, you know, is valuable because X, Y, and Z and a reason resources are more than likely need to go in this location. Not, not that other location, locations are ignored, but there's still, there's still a chance of making a greater impact here and preserving what remnants of, of biodiversity we have in, at this location. Thanks, Dr. Kramer. So I, uh, I want to open the panelists up to um, some questions from the audience. And we've had a number of questions come come in. So I'm going to read a question. And if you feel strongly, Will, Beth, or Dr. Kramer about a, a particular question, feel free to just jump right in and answer it. Um, one of the first ones that had come in was about um, how, how do you recommend removing or disposing of pulled invasive plants? And I, I'm curious about this one, too, because I have so many on my property. Uh, we bag it. A lot of times, you know, we don't want to compost it, spread it around. So if we're hand pulling something, um, especially something that's in seed, something that spreads through the rhizomes or any sort of other plant material, we'll bag it um, and and um, and take it take it to the dump where they're going to most likely burn it. Um, so that that that's our our best method for anything that's hand pulled. To at the risk of using uh, Google as a verb, um, I would just say there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of very good information available very quickly on the web because each each type of invasive plant often requires a slightly different management style, and uh, the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group (SIPWIG) um, has put out uh, pretty good fact sheets for each invasive plant. So. If you have an idea of what you have on your property, probably there's a, a good piece of, of literature out there that is easily accessible to, to talk about management options. I, I would I would agree. Um, it's best to know what you're what you're dealing with and what the best disposal uh, sanitation tactics might be, because something like mugweed or or Japanese knotweed. It just takes a small little piece to become a problem very quickly. Yep. Yeah. And it definitely depends too on the, the timing of when you uh, pull or cut or remove it. Um, if it has seeds, if it, you know, the different stages of, of it, of a plant, if we're talking about plants. 
Um, Beth, I'm gonna shoot this question to you. Um, this is from somebody in the audience. There's a small wetland area in my neighborhood where porcelain berry is choking the trees. Is it not true that I can't touch anything in a wetland area? That is not true. Uh, in fact, we encourage management of invasive species in wetland areas. Um, we discourage clearing, uh, clear, clear cutting or, or taking out uh, plants that you don't know what they are, uh, but invasive species are definitely one of our priorities. And if you want some help or advice on, on best ways of, of going about that, uh, please ask the department because we're happy to help and, and guide you in the best management methods. Um, there's This is a good one. Um, the nematodes that are predating our beech trees, are they considered invasive? Do we know if they're invasive? Yes. Yes. They're They, they have yeah. done genetic testing on it. They've, they've found that the nematode is uh, at this point um, a specific or a couple of different regions of, of Japan. Okay. Uh, how does one differentiate between native and invasive Phragmites? Mm, good question. Um, uh, I there's I'm sorry, Beth, are you saying something? I, I was just gonna say, Greg, that I, I've been a wetland biologist for 35 years and I don't think I've ever actually been able to key out the native Phragmites. Um, so, and it's not because I haven't tried a couple of times. Um, it it uh, is very difficult to do. It, it is, and there's, there's evidently hybrids out there too. Um, Plants love to mess around. <laughs> Is, is the, the, the sheath on the, the leaf collar is one way and the inflorescence um, is also another way. And, and, and a quick way they, they, they say is if it's not growing very densely and it's under a certain height, but that could be because of a local type of environment that it's growing in. So it, it's, it is difficult, but, but there are, there are ways. And I, I think the best key out is, is the leaf sheath at this point. My understanding is right. It's unlikely, I think, that most of us will ever see a stand of native Phragmites, um, a pure stand of it. I, it. It's around, I'm sure, but it's it's not the common thing you see. Yep. Another question is about the spotted lantern fly, and um, are they attracted to particular plants that are found in gardens? common gardens uh yes they are they they um uh, like a lot of the stone fruit trees uh so cherry uh apples peaches um, um plums any of those types of trees they're highly attracted to also grapevines um actually i think they also do like porcelain berry which, hey, is, uh, which is I like that, <laughs> but uh, but yes, they they have a they have a varied uh, a varied diet. Not good for for us. Um, no. Uh, another question. Uh, this one came from Kim. Please comment on best practices for removing garlic mustard. Would love love this, love to hear this one. Um, I mean, I'm gonna uh, layman's way is pan pull it um it comes up really easily um it's great you know we do public events it's an easy identified herbaceous plant um, especially in the early spring um and it can be pulled up by anyone over the age of two years old <laughs> that's just an easy way of saying it's it, you know we have families that come out um kids of all ages identify it throw a tarp down and hand pull it um that is by far the easiest um, way. And it really involves the community, which is a great, a great way to engage people. And as long as it hasn't gone to seed, you yes. can just let it compost. You don't need to worry about it. It's not gonna spread vegetatively. And yes. the way you can tell that you're gonna have garlic mustard, it's a biennial. 
So the first year, it's just a little rosette, uh, uh, just a little leaf uh, that actually looks a lot like a violet leaf. And then it's the second spring that that will that will sprout and put up the the um, reproductive plant that will produce seeds. So get that reproductive plant before it produces seeds. It's always like perfectly to pull it right around Earth Day too. Yeah, it's like you know it hasn't gone to seed yet. It's very That's usually. Really that's really good to remember well. Yeah. Um, so there are two questions left and um, they're both very good. So I'm gonna let's see if we can get these done in the next few minutes. But one is what are your feelings on nativars versus straight species? Or anybody wanna tackle that one? Uh, you know, oh, I'll let Greg. Uh, well, uh, just a quick, you know, quick comment on that is what what is, you know what's what's the you know intent of the plant if if it's a native restoration project then absolutely it should be native species um but if it's in the yard and it's a native r um that's okay um you know there's there's a uh, i'm a horticulturalist and I, I find you know native plants and all their cultivars to be cool so uh but th but there's a place for for that and uh and i don't know will did you have anything you wanted to add no, no, you said it very well. I think that, you know, as a gardener myself, it's wonderful to have a native R um, in place of an invasive plant by sh by far, but it's also um, when we're doing restoration projects, um, natives, especially local genotypes are uh, obviously the way to go. And our seed to seed program hits on that. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug here, but we have a great uh, plant sale on Mother's Day weekend, the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, all the plants that we are selling, we've grown from seed that we've collected sustainably here in town. Um, so these are uh, genotypes that have evolved in our ecosystems here in Southwestern Connecticut. Um, and they're wonderful to plant in your garden, but um, equally as important um, planting as part of restoration and, and habitat projects. So glad you mentioned that well, thank you. And uh, let us know to send us the, the flyer for that. We'll help promote it for you guys. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and last question, and um, this is such an important question. Um, so thank you, Robert, uh, in the audience for asking, but how does climate change come into play about all of all of this? That was a big big question to end on, yeah. but it's important. Do you important. have another it's two hours? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, but I, I think it's good to, to, we gotta address the elephant in the room. Well, I only think it's exacerbating the problem. I mean, that's the easy way. It's not helping it by any means. Um, so I, again, with time crunch here, I think, you know, from our standpoint, we're seeing, you know, the spread of in, invasives um, more so as our winters are are not as cold. You know, I can think, think of two or three species that are really controlled by cold weather. And without that, I mean, take this winter, for instance, we barely um we we got almost no snow and we ran about between 10 and 15 degrees warmer than normal through january and february um you know so there's insects particularly that are spreading and and because of that um or they're not dying back um so that's just a quick example of how climate change will impact it is it's allowing these invasive plants and insects and pathogens to to spread easier Climate change is also putting the native plants and um, some of the native uh, fauna under stress. It, they're not they're not uh, going through their normal cycle, and and it's a stressor which allows invasives another chance to get a, a toehold. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and and the the higher concentrations they've done research of carbon in the atmosphere has benefited a lot of fast growing plants that don't necessarily have to invest a lot of energy into producing wood structural wood and a lot of those become you know they're they're vines they're basically uh you know absorbing the, the carbon and growing at astronomical rates um and most of that's going into reproduction well Beth. 
Dr. Kramer, thank you so much for your time tonight and for your for sharing your expertise and your and your knowledge with us. Um, thank you to all of our um, attendees and everybody um, that helped put this night together. We're we're very grateful and thankful for that. Um, for everyone that registered, there will be that follow-up email that will have the recording, we'll have resources, we'll be sure to include some photos of all of these species that we talked about. Um, but, but thank you again, and, and um, we hope to see you at some of our next uh, webinars and events. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Have a good thank night. you everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Will. Thank good you, night. Sarah. Thank you.